Hi, this is Yao Williams, VP of Global Brand Partnerships at ESL Facet Group, and this is One on One with ABC Partners. Hi, this is Dave Almy of ADC Partners. So you think you'll do just about anything to close a sports marketing partnership. But how about eating bullfrog soup? Well, that's what this episode's guest Yao Williams did once. Yes, just the once. Currently the Vice President of Global Partnerships for Esports Juggernaut ESL Facet Group, Yao's path through the sports business world has been a remarkable one. He started out like so many of us do in this industry, in ticket sales. But his unique blend of grit, competitiveness, and thoughtfulness is what put him at the center of one of the most dynamic parts of this industry today. In this episode, Al and I talk about his origin story in sports business and the skill sets he employed to aid his rise. We discuss how those same skill sets helped him succeed in China, a country he'd never visited or had any language skills whatsoever. We also review the state of the ever-shifting esports business world and where he sees that industry headed. Oh, and he provides some tips on what to do if ever served that steaming helping of bullfrog soup. So bon appetit. Yeah, Williams, I think it's true that one of the axioms of sports is that if you want to get a job in sports, you start in ticket sales, right? And it is, I, you know, there's I, the hundreds of people that can share that story about getting their start in sports. And that 100% describes who you are. I mean, you sold tickets for the Indians in Major League Baseball, AFL Gladiators, NBA Hornets, Yankees. I mean, that's ticket sales experience. And I'm wondering, what are a few things you learned in that earlier part of your career that really shaped you and who you are today and your approach? Yeah, I will say... um... Definitely the grind. I mean, yeah. I think that there is obviously it is the kind of gateway into sports is also quickly you'll quickly decide if sports is for you. Yeah. Uh, some people, I mean, I think a lot of people are they they become interested in sports simply because they're a fan. Yeah. You realize the grind, you're like, holy crap, this is not for me. So <laughs> they quickly you know, stop becoming a fan. Like, yeah, no, nope, no, nope, I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, because you think about it, like, oh, it's going to be free tickets, right? I'll, I'll get to my favorite team play. <laughs> no, I get like, to go to see the games yeah. for free. Yeah, like, yeah. You won't see, uh, everything will be a blur. You'll be actually be annoyed. You, you, you would be quickly to leave a leave an arena or stadium when it's the end of the third quarter, or when it's the fifth inning. Um, but, but to answer your question, it, it's, Definitely the grind, the hard work, uh, making 100 phone calls a day, um, coming in on the weekends. So it, it really kind of tests your um, your work ethic. Yeah. Um, that 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 with that that's kind of laid the foundation for um, my career. Within do you, the, with do you feel like you came to those jobs with that worth work ethic in place, or was that something you had to be like, oh boy, this is this is a different level? Um, I think. To be very transparent, I I found school to be relatively easy, so I never. That was not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I didn't I didn't work that hard. I was yeah. like, oh, I could I could either work hard and get an A or do okay and get a B and have right. fun. Like, right. I'll get the B. I'll get the B plus. That's I'll fine. Get the- <laughs> <laughs> I get a couple A minuses in there, um, <laughs> and. But the difference was I'm I'm very competitive. Okay. So it, it was more being around people that I thought, I mean, not thought, they were my peers. Yep. And to see them working hard, I was like, yeah, no, nobody's going to work me. That, that, give that a little happen. bit of a sense of what those those ticket offices are like. I mean, you have your name on a whiteboard. You have your yeah. progress. I mean, it when you talk about competitive, those offices – are the very definition of you see how you're doing financially right against your peers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you, you literally, the, the board has the most sophisticated board. I think we had was uh, with the Charlotte Hornets. Well, at the time of the Bobcats, it was your name. It was the amount of phone calls you made. It was the 
amount of appointments you set, mm-hmm. amount of appointments you completed, mm-hmm. amount of referrals you have, and then got into revenue. Because the, the and the thought process was, hey, if you're doing the right things consistently well, the money will come. And you and I was thankful to have um at the time my my boss was Mark Jackson. He's now uh VP of tickets for the Denver Broncos. Mm-hmm. Um of just him kind of having that vision, having that thought process, because I've also been in spaces where within 90 days, like, all right, where's the money? And you're like, yeah, I'm grinding. I'm trying like, yeah, but where's the money? And yep. I remember my first few months there, I was a nervous wreck. Like I'm going to get fired. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. It is not for the faint of heart at all. And he was like, look, you're doing the right things this year. I didn't expect much. Cause I, I think I came in middle of the season he was like, but next year, I think you'll be fine. And he was right. I ended up doing very well that, that, that following year. You start to get that repetitive cycle of making those Absolutely. calls and man, being comfortable, like, like, like with most people in sales, comfortable with being told no. Right. Oh and- I, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I literally was just telling somebody that you get, you become very comfortable with hearing no. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't bruise, it doesn't bruise you as much. You develop some armor. Absolutely, absolutely, and then you f- and you figure out why why is no. So I think it it begins mm-hmm. to help you build out great questioning for life. I mean, I I literally, I mean, as as we were kind of joking before before this started, even dealing with side projects I'm working on, when I hear a no, I need to understand the whys. I need to understand is this a no because you don't want to do it. Is this a no because it's a not yet? Is this a no? Like, I just need to understand it because that will allow me to figure out, first of all, to be comfortable with, but also how to how to figure out my next move and next steps. How to start triangulating and how to start using that content for future calls because, you know, Absolutely. like you point, like you pointed out, what's the reason? What's the why? It's not that many reasons for why. Right. Right. Yeah, right. There's there's you're going to hear a reputa- repetition and things like that. And I'm interesting to it's I'm interested as well. Right. So you, you spent time selling tickets and you develop a real skill set, obviously. Yeah. And you move over to the NBA and you start working on partnerships. Right. Yeah. Which is a different sell. But I'm it wondering is. what carried over, you know, what did you carry over from ticket sales and what did you have to relearn or change about your approach? Absolutely. So to give you context on even me receiving that, that role at the mm-hmm. NBA. I was in premium sales. I was at this crossroads because typically the ticket sales route is you go from inside sales, account executive, premium sales, and then you either either take a premium sales manager role or maybe go down to inside sales manager. And now you work up that road, work up that path to eventually become VP of ticket sales. Yep. Um, I didn't have an interest to be a VP of ticket sales. Um, <laughs> you saw that guy and was like, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this, this is, the, I mean, and God bless him. I have a lot of friends that are in the space, but I, yep. I wanted to uh, kind of widen my skill sets. One, get into partnerships. I was a basketball junkie. Mm-hmm. I found out who was running the NBA um, Gold Marketing Partnership Group, who at the time was Mark Tatum, who's now the deputy commissioner of the NBA. Mm-hmm. Sent him a code email. Out of the blue, just like Mark blue. Tatum, I'm Yao. Well, again, I'm used to hearing no. So worst case stuff is in response. You're used and to know. Right. Right. So I, I sent him a note basically saying, what do I need to do in the next 12, 10 to 12 months to be on your radar? And oh, I was like, let's take 10 minutes. Out of great question. And he, he said, hey, happy to talk. Copied his assistant. He responded in 15 minutes, which was amazing. We jumped on a call. I proceeded to ask those questions like, what do I need to do? Do I need to sell more stuff? Yeah, what are you do looking I for? Do, bigger deals? Yeah. do I need to, hey, do a partnership deal, a part of a part of a sweet deal? And and even I was very respectful of his time. I think we got into maybe minute 12. And I was like, hey, I want to be mindful. I asked for 10 minutes. We're on minute 12. And he was like, hey, well, have you looked at any of our jobs? And I was like, honestly, I didn't because that wasn't my ask. I wasn't going to try to asked you for a job. I just wanted to know what I need to do. He said, well, I think you're ready now and I'll connect you with the right people. <laughs> and I was like, okay, great. <laughs> we later had a call from the NBA, said, hey, Mark Tatum spoke really highly of you. We'd love to jump on a call. And I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Is then, there a part of you that was like, am I being pranked here? Like, I, what's I, happening? I really did. I and, and it, I mean, and know what it is. I think I my respect level for Mark Tatum is the highest of high. 
I'm just so used to people giving you giving me lip service. So I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll connect you with some people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then like you have to follow with them. You have to bug them. So the fact that we had one call and then two weeks later, I got an email and a call from the NBA. And then three months later, granted, it was a, it was a very challenging interview process. Three months later, I had a job with the NBA. And so now going to the NBA, my number one goal was to make sure I didn't disappoint Mark Tatum. <laughs> right. Yeah, and absolutely. Whatever he, whatever's on his radar is on my radar. I will make sure I'm not an embarrassment. I'm going to make sure I crush it. I'm going to make sure like when people say, oh, when they bring up my name, it's only going to be the, the positive things. So to answer your question, I mean, it, it was a massive adjustment. I mean, I, I had a good friend of mine that was already in partnerships. Her um, her name is Mika, Mika White, CRO at, at the Twins, Minnesota Twins. Um, I remember asking her for a list of terminology, like just terms that are more sp- sponsorship related, partnership related than ticket sales. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the more media related. So just like studying that. I was now my wife, the time she was my my girlfriend, she would see me after I got off work at seven or eight o'clock at night, I would come <laughs> home, eat dinner. And, and on the train ride, I would print out, before the train ride, I would print out articles from Sports Business Journal. Yeah, you were studying. And, and studying nonstop. Yep. Um, so, the, the, so if anything, the, the biggest transition was Tr- becoming more of a marketer mm-hmm. uh, the skill sets that i had going in there was already being a solution-based seller so i and, and it may be because the, the the hornets at the time when i joined or the bobcats when i joined i mean look our, our selling our strong piece was selling larry brown as our coach we had gerald wallace as on our team raymond felton like we didn't we didn't have any massive superstars um and we were selling our, our pitch was more selling as a business opportunity than, hey, I hope you're a diehard fan of, of the Bobcats. Going to the Yankees, New York, that I find that to be New York's team yep. out of the teams in, in the city. With that being said, this is a new stadium. We're in the middle of an economic crisis, yep. of a recession, and we're selling legend seats, four seats for a quarter million dollars, a suite for half a million dollars. So yeah, I'm a diehard fan, but why does this make sense for my business? So being very objective oriented and understanding their their goals. Understanding what their motivations are, right? Absolutely. And then, yeah. so that moment, that ability to carry over into partnerships. Yep. And we talk about this quite a lot in a lot of the work that we do. It's particularly when you're on the partnership industry, you can't think of yourself as a salesperson because no one on the brand side wants to talk to a salesperson. But if you're a solution provider, if you're coming at them with how this property I'm representing can assist you in the things that you're trying to do for your rent, that's what they want. They want someone thinking on their behalf. Absolutely. And so that's that you talked about the solution based selling from the from those high end Yankees tickets to going to a brand and saying, OK, what are you trying to accomplish? It yeah. sounds like that was a pretty it was I'm going to call it an easy transition, but it sounds like your mindset and your grind was already there. Yeah. And, and honestly, it gave me comfort on pitching numbers. I was already used to pitching some pretty, pretty hefty numbers already. Yeah. I, I will say again, the hardest transition by far was writing and becoming that marketer from a, from a, from a writing perspective, because typically in ticket sales, you are, you're having big meetings, but the email I'm sending to you as a follow-up is, Hi, hi, David. Great meeting with you. Per our conversation, section one thirty one, da 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 da, is available. Like it's it's very very transactional. Yeah, 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 very transactional. Where the the proposals and the presentation you're putting together for a deck or for Kumo Tire or for Diageo, you're storytelling how this makes sense for their brand, and and then now once they see the the cool slides, and now they want to see a white paper. I mean, it's still is is literally a marketing kind of masterpiece. And, and my background was a political science major, so I didn't I didn't understand the the let's talk about the sky and how the rain, how the wind feels against your skin. Like <laughs> I'm a very <laughs> hey boom 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 boom. So I remember writing my first few proposals, and my boss pulled me aside, and I remember him like ripping me apart. And I was like, "What the heck is this? This is horrible!" And I was like. Huh. So it took, again, a lot of iterations of like being able to 
accept criticism. Um, I, I positioned my brain as I was getting my master's in sponsorships or partnerships. So I was completely okay with whatever they needed me to do, I was going to do. So, I mean, it, it, it worked itself out, but it, it was definitely drinking out of a fire hose. <laughs> so you spend some time at the NBA. Yeah. And you, you develop a skill set in partnerships, right? You, you successfully make this transition from, from that, that, that broad starting point in ticket sales where you had success. You develop skills and success at the NBA, and, and then you transition to City Football Group. Yeah. Where uh, you were ultimately in charge of partnership sales in China. So yeah. this is a two-parter, all right? So for those folks who might be unfamiliar with City Football, can you give a little bit of a snapshot? I think most people are obviously familiar with the NBA and things like that, but City Football might be a little bit off the radar. Can you give a snapshot of the company? And then what was the transition like from North America to selling in China? And how did, and how did that go? Yeah, so City Football Group is a consortium of football clubs um, it, or soccer teams. Mm -hmm. Um, it is owned by the Abu Dhabi royal family, Sheikh Mansour, and essentially <clears throat> the anchor of those consortium of soccer teams is Manchester City Football Club. Um, Manchester City, when you think about Manchester, you think about the team in red, um, and their mindset, a city football group, was, okay. You won't even say their name, will you? They're still just the team in red. They're the team in red. I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> and so with that, it was, they own, when you think of Manchester, you think of them. When you think of city, you'll think of us. Mm -hmm. And so they purchased Manchester City Football Club. They then went on to purchase New York City Football Club, <clears throat> purchased Melbourne Hearts, and they rebranded to Melbourne City Football mm -hmm. Club, bought it, um, had a joint partnership with the Yokohama Marinos uh, with, mm. with Nissan. Um, but now fast forward. So when I and was Tom the, was Tom Glick running the show at this point? Tom Tom, Tom was our our um, our chief revenue officer. Got it. Yep. Um, and then he 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 was a jack of all trades. So he went from CRO. Then uh, we needed some assistant NYC CFC. So he ended up becoming president there. Then he went back to CRO uh, for City Football. Uh, so he's the one that that kind of brought me on as well as, as well as a couple others. Okay. Um, long story short, they went from four clubs to by the time I left nine clubs, I think okay. now they're at 13 clubs yep. around the world. So okay. um, you have a partnership team that is selling individual teams, but City Football Group commercial team is selling the portfolio. The network. The network. Got yes. it. All right. So how did, how did how did China come about for you? Did they say, hey, guess what? No, so they they were just again about action, which I appreciated. I, I when I left the NBA, I I did a stint in Brazil at the NBA, then got bit by the international bug. Uh, mm -hmm. Was speaking to City. The plan was for me to go to London, and then maybe in the final interview, they said, "Hey, by the way, we're thinking about an open office in the Americas, and we would love for you to be the first employee there." Okay, and I was. Oh, I don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't go to London. That's why. That's why I'm interested in this job. That's what got me hooked. That's what got me hooked. And it was like, look, help us figure out the Americas, and then we'll send you wherever you want to go in the world. I was like, fine. Okay. Two years. Two years goes by. They say, look, we have a proposition. We want you to stay in the Americas. We'll promote you, or you can go to London. It'll be a lateral move, or we're thinking about open office in China. And you can help us run that business. I was like, oh, I'll go to China. So just and no hesitation. No hesitation. And, and what, was, what was the draw? There was a lot. There was a lot. I mean, I felt like the world was moving east. Yep. Uh, and, and to figure that out would would be another way to separate myself, selfishly separate myself from my peers. Yep. I think I was always interested in moving abroad. And initially the plan, not plan, but my vision was mm -hmm. to work for NBA China. And that, that process was a bit a bit more challenging. So it's like, all right, I've been always thinking about moving abroad, moving to Asia, convinced my wife maybe a year or two prior, like, hey, if this happened, would you be interested? Oh, you were and laying she, the groundwork. Um, planting seeds. <laughs> <laughs> step by step, step by step. So um, the evil plan comes together. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so no, it, it, it came together. And um, I, I will say, and I, I don't want to, kind of um it was an amazing experience 
an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. It was probably some of my most challenging work um, because I wasn't, there wasn't a ton of tools there. It was like literally you're building something from scratch. So I don't have, I don't have an assistant. I don't have. Um, so it me, is you. It, it is literally me. It, it was literally me or myself. And um, we had a managing director for the region who just left the Nike football, Nike soccer. And he was joining the team and I was leading the commercial business of it. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't speak a language. I didn't. I mean, I had to move my stuff on my own. I had to figure out my housing on my own. Oh my I had God, they really well just welcomed to China. It was welcome to China. And so it, it was it was definitely challenging. And and I never shared this publicly with anyone, uh, maybe with a, a couple of friends over beers, maybe at the six month mark. I'm like, yep, I'm good. I'm going home. <laughs> like, oh. this is, this is <laughs> like, this is this is crazy. This is I've crazy. conquered China. And, <laughs> I'm, I, yeah, I, I, it's not it's not for me. And and it was many, it was a number from vertical that was it was a number of different reasons. And I remember sitting down with my wife and I was like, now I'm gonna stick around. I was like, because the narrative can't be that this was too hard. Right. Okay. Like so, I, we, 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 we we're gonna kind of hunker down on on this and, and figure it out. And and look, it was like, look, best case scenario, I get deals done, I crush it. Worst case scenario, I get a couple of extra stamps on my passport and I see the, I see part of Asia. Mm -hmm. And we were fortunate enough that we were successful in the region. Was there a turning point? Was there a moment where you went, here's what I need to do differently? Was it enough or more just like burrowing in and saying, going back to the grind ethic? Yeah. I mean, there, there was, I mean, definitely the grind, but I, there was the biggest shift was storytelling. Mm -hmm. I don't speak the language. So even if yeah. somebody, even if there is a a CMO that does speak the language or his assistant speaks the language, his voc his English vocabulary may be only 500 words. Right. Or 300 limit, words. It doesn't so, limit the so, ability to share a story. Exactly. So now you have to, you have to oversimplify your story without it feeling transactional. Yeah. Um, so that part was, was the biggest challenge. I'm like, okay, how do I find the right words to articulate how great of an opportunity this is? I think also understanding the the sales process, right? I mean, the 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 culture in Asia is very uh, a kind of a keep face, like they mm -hmm. don't they, they don't want to say no, they don't want to offend, so, right? And they don't uh, want to make you feel bad, so everything becomes a lot of maybe. And all those things you can appreciate, but it becomes challenging when you may have a European headquarter that is like, well, where's the deals? Where's the money? Like, Where's the money? So you're trying to balance both of those. And you're building relationships and you know going Absolutely. through all the a very, very long and sometimes convoluted process to do so. A Absolutely. And, and, I, and I will say, I tell people this, your ability to build relationships with other Westerners, I think is easier in Asia versus in the US. Like I, mm -hmm. I as an example, I can't just bump into the CMO of GM and he's going to say, Oh, Hey, how are you? Where <laughs> in China, it, it, it's literally China is, is an amazing place. And the, the, the executives that are Westerners, they're all pretty tight. tight -knit, yeah. So it's like, Oh, you, you're from, you're from the U S oh, I'm from the U S too. Hey, right. Come on, yeah. come on over. You join us for this uh, lunch. We do every Wednesday. Exactly. So like it becomes a bit, it's a bit more easier to get to, to, to engage with, with Western executives. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, again, we had an amazing time. I was committed to even staying there longer. Yep. <laughs> and my wife received an amazing opportunity to come back to the U S. Okay. So it's like, all right, look, my job got us there. She, we've been there for two years. She, she, she did her, uh, she did her process for you. <laughs> she, she, she did her process. Right. Yeah. So, so that, that's what brought us back uh, to the States. So you, to this point, had been working in what I'll call traditional sports, the stick and ball stuff. Yep. Right. And then ESL FASIC group arrives on your scene. Yeah. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, that's a, one of the leading event producers for eSports. This is a, this is not your traditional sports cell. I'm wondering what drew you to the opportunity to go to something. I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm interested what drew you to the opportunity and how it met or did not meet your expectations when it comes to partnership sales. Yeah. So my logic was slightly similar to China. Mm -hmm. It was understanding next generation consumers. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I felt that and and all and it's not a secret and um, all the leagues are aware all the traditional stick and ball sport leagues are aware of this but this next generation consumers consume content very differently than how we consumed it right or, or consume it so they're not watching a full 48 minutes of a basketball game they're not watching a full 90 minutes of a soccer match they're watching it in short clips and like, all right i saw two minutes of it two minutes of highlights house of highlights it. baby house of highlights right so understand that was was really important. I think I wanted to dig a little bit deeper in media as well. Yeah. Um, and, and and I mean, natively, I'm a, I think most people around my age grew up gaming, whether that was with Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, et cetera. I personally haven't probably picked up a comp, picked up the sticks as, as we like to say, or, or um, in probably a decade. Hey, you're talking um, to an Atari 2600 guy. I'm OG. Yeah. So, so, so you get it. So like, I, I think that there is, um, so those were the things that were intriguing and interested in the role. So I guess it's like, it can be such a, um, such a unique and different cell yeah, in some yeah. capacities, right? The events are different. The spectators are different. The, 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 the even the assets uh, can be yeah. dramatically different. Um, the willingness, like I had a great conversation with Ari Mark down at Drone Racing. Yeah, yeah, no, and he, yeah. So he, I mean, it's kind of like you're you're building a template for something that is still developing. Yeah, definitely. I, I look, I, I think that there is the biggest challenge has been the um, the level of education. Yeah. When someone says esports, yeah. It's equivalent to somebody saying, I'm a fan of sports. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, what's what sports? part? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then based on that sports, it's a totally different demographic, totally different process. So are you a fan of rugby or are you a fan of tennis? You're a fan of basketball. Fan of... So when somebody says they're an esports fan or a gaming fan, Fortnite or is it Call of Duty? Is yeah. it Counter Strike? Is it Dota 2? Is it Rocket League? So th that, that part has been, <clears throat> I think a lot of brands know that they should be in the space. But then understanding where and how is the part that they're all trying to figure out and where we're where we're tasked with kind of guiding them, right? Have have brands gotten more sophisticated in this area? Do you feel like I mean esports has kind of been around now for four or five years? On at least I'm gonna say on I mean they've been around obviously a lot longer, but like on a sort of broad zeitgeist kind of perspective, like people see them, feel like they understand. Are, brand, are brands getting better at it or is there still a huge educational curve? There is a massive education. <laughs> massive. I mean, I mean you know, look, there, there are brands that have played and dabbled in the space. Yeah. And you and what you've seen is, and this is not true for all of us, I don't want to typecast. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what you'll see is a CMO task there marketing manager that may be 28 years old right say hey you figure out this game go figure it out <laughs> yeah yeah. We, we, we don't need to be in the space figure it out yeah and then you have and they may know it they and they will they not may they will know it um but i think the hard part is they may give that marketing manager a relatively small budget to test yep put your toe then, in the water exactly and once you test you prove it then it scales so most of our deals have kind of went from Hey, this one event, and we've over delivered. And they said, "Okay, all right, let's do three events. Do three events. Okay, now let's do the full year. Now let's do multi year." So, our a lot of our partnerships started with the one, and kind of has expanded into multiple multi year uh, partnerships that are now high seven figure and eight figure type deals. This is really where your skill set that you developed to be a consultative seller. Absolutely. comes to really bear, doesn't it? Because yeah. you you have to be the expert on behalf of the brands because they're looking at this thing in their hands and going, uh, <laughs> I want to figure it out. Yeah, You're the person who comes with the expertise to show them how to do that. Are most brands willing to accept that? Like the you coming to them and saying, here's how you should do it? Or do they want to be more in control of the, we know what we're doing, we know what our brand needs? They 100% want their hand held. Um, <laughs> Like, I mean, it, which is great. I mean, it's it awesome. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it makes it easier. I mean, it, it, no, I don't say 100%. Every yeah. once in a while, it, it's the, hey, we, we saw this one game that everybody's playing. We want that. We want that. Right, and okay. then you kind of have to educate them like, okay, you want that because of what? And what do you want to do with it? Yeah. And, and based on that answer, hopefully I can say, okay, that's what you're trying to achieve. 
that's not what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. You should be focused on this right here because it has this many millions of people watching it. This is where you can impact, um, your brand can be more impactful. Um, there is, I think another example is there's some games that are high, has a high level of participation, but not a ton of people are watching. Mm. So the, the engagement's great. The numbers might not be fantastic. Exactly. So like educating them on that is, is, is really important, but yeah, it, it's, it's been a, it's been a great journey. I think a lot of them have been like, Hey, look, we're, we're, we know we need to figure it out. And then the question is when, I mean, and then there's also certain categories that will probably move a little bit slower. Like the banking category is a bit more traditional sports where the, maybe the new banks, such as maybe the cash apps and the, and the revolution in Europe and things like that, like they're the ones that may be more in, interested in, in trying something different, trying to reach this next generation. Right, it's hard to compete with the big branks and the, again, going back to the traditional stick and ball sports, right? The, the, the yeah. amount of money and things like that. And this is a new opportunity, but you just said something that I want to key in on for a second, because you talked about, you know, this is popular in Europe and this is popular in here and you're in charge of global partnerships, gaming audiences in Europe and in North America and in Asia, they come at the same game with different cultural perspectives, different attitudes towards it, different attitudes towards what they expect to see from brands. And you're in charge of <laughs> pulling pulling all this together. Talk about that challenge a little bit on selling on an international scale and adapting these partnerships for diverse audiences. Yeah, I think... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a big one. It's a big one, but it's it's honestly fairly simple. It's okay. really thinking wide, and it's about just your level of questioning. Yep. Uh, to those brands, understanding their real key markets, understanding their real objectives, understanding those objectives shift per region, and we are we probably have one of the most diverse portfolios in esports. Mm -hmm. We're handling maybe five of the top fifteen games. As well as we have our a gaming festival, such mm -hmm. as Hack, which is around this across 12 countries. We have a gaming platform as well. And and with that, so when we're going to a brand, we're literally going as a full portfolio and laying it out for them. Yeah, exactly. And using your example, not to mention any brands, but we can stick with banking as, as a simple example. Banking in the US may not touch or maybe a bit hesitant to touch a first person shooter game. Banking in Brazil, let's have it. They're, they're completely okay with it. Right? <laughs> yeah. Banking yeah, yeah. In, in Eastern Europe, completely okay with it. So, so it, it is really, it's really now in using again sticking with that example. You're going to that bank and saying, "Look, in the U.S., I have this property for you. I have DreamHack. I have Rocket League, etc." For Latin America, we can focus on Counter Strike. For uh, Europe, we can focus on X, Y, and Z. So you, you you're literally really becoming a a consultant to their needs that fluidity um, really gives you an advantage right you can really tailor you can really tailor access to the needs of the brand the the country the, absolutely. the customers it's got to be kind of interesting and exciting that way right when you've come out from selling well this is the ticket or you know this is the nba and this is the way yeah. we do things this is is it a lot more do you feel like it's a lot more creative Absolutely. I mean, you you almost feel like you almost begin to operate almost like an agency. Like you're like we're we're an agency, at least the commercial driven ag agencies. They're selling a a suite of sports properties. Mm -hmm. Hey, we have this one baseball team, this one basketball team, this one football team, this one Formula One team. What do you and in this roster of talent? What are you interested in? Whatever you're interested in, we can handle. Right. And we're kind of going into brands with the same approach and saying, Hey, if you're trying any of your gaming needs, we can pretty much handle. If you want to put on white label tournaments, if you want to be in, in, in sold out arenas across the world, you're going to be across festivals. If you want, like, we can, we can service your needs. It feels like esports for a while there, particularly during the pandemic, right? You know, most stadiums are empty. What's the alternative? Right. And esports kind of filled that need for a while. And it was it was what people it was like crypto and esports were the two things that everybody was talking about. Yeah. I think that 
personally, I feel like that's slackened a bit. Do you feel like the industry is at a sort of watershed moment? Is it progressing the way you expected it to? What do you, what do you feel like is going to be next for not just EL FASIC, game, FASIC group, but, you know, esports in general, where, where does the industry head? Is there a shakeout? What, what's going to happen? Yeah. So personally, everything that is transpiring, I kind of expected. Um, I feel like there was, there was a bit of a runway and people mm-hmm. love excitement and with the level of excitement, people spend how they spend, right? Um, <laughs> a little bit of a rush. And, right. And, but with that being said, I think the underlying value proposition of esports is still the same. I think that there's a, the competitive gaming, competitive gaming offers kind of this inroad to this young, digitally native demographic mm-hmm. that is just hard to reach. I mean, yep. this is a group that are ad blockers. They are, they don't, if you're not speaking to them in an authentic way, they will hit the Reddits, the, the Twitters and bash you pretty quickly. Um, where traditional sports, you're kind of used to brand. You're like, oh God, it changed my state, it changed my favorite stadium name again. All right, whatever, that's weird. And you go back and you you continue to support and you, you see you still see your team play every Sunday. And and the reality is, I mean, there's still more than I want to say there's more than like a three billion gamers worldwide. I want to say there's close to 500 million esport esport audience. So I mean, look, there's still a huge consumer base that brands can't ignore. So I I think that. Even though things may have slowed down, I, I I obviously think it's here for the long haul, um, and I think it's I think it almost levels some stuff out. But I mean, we're we're committed, we're dedicated, we're we're growing and expanding. So um, yeah, that's 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 at least my my personal thoughts. On yeah. That. So as we wrap up, I'm gonna I'm gonna read back something to you that you you gave an interview in uh, 2012. Oh. <laughs> in 2012 it's not that it's not scary come on i wouldn't do that to you that comes later uh you gave an interview and you were asked where you see yourself in 10 years time and you responded you know overall helping brands maximize revenue on an international scale along with teaching some in some capacity wow so um so go ahead and grade yourself for me how'd you do that's an a that's an a yeah, yeah. well well done yeah, Williams, head of global partnerships for um, uh, ESL FASIC Group. Uh, I really want to thank you for the time today. But um, before I let you go, uh, this truly is the scary part of the conversation. This is when I put you in the lightning round. Uh, these are questions you have no idea what's about to come. And I want you to give the shortest, most concise, <laughs> immediate answer you possibly can. Yeah, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did not sound confident. All right, here we go. You've taught at sports management programs at NYU and Georgetown. Would your mm-hmm. students call you an easy or a tough grader? A tough grader. Tough grader. High expectations. I get it. Yeah. All right. Uh, like we said, you started in ticket sales. What is mm-hmm. some advice on what not to do in that role? If you're interviewing for a role, don't tell them you're taking this role just to get your foot in the door. Ah, very good. The end of the means is the end. Uh, mm-hmm. In the same article I just quoted, you were also asked Moe or Bud, and you responded Moe. Is that still the case? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Ooh la la, Mr. <laughs> Williams. Uh, as discussed, you lived in China. What does bullfrog soup taste like? Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's different. I think I... <laughs> I I did a good job of taking a sip and I think I like pushed it away, put a napkin on top of it, and it's like, yeah, go and take this one out real quick. Yeah. I, I, I didn't I think I ate the I think I tasted the broth. I didn't really eat the, the bowl for all. You didn't all. you didn't go down deep into the bowl. No, no. Okay. Uh last one. Uh re- recording this on my birthday. What did you get me? Uh, um yeah, I mean, it, it, I think a package is coming. It, 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 uh, like, like <laughs> Again, not confidence instilling. I am not going to sit at the at the post office box waiting for that one to arrive. You said it'll be in a few hours, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was lots of fun, man. Thanks for taking the time. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the One-on-One Sports Business Conversations podcast. If you enjoyed it, we always appreciate a subscribe, share, comment, or like. 
And don't forget, you can always find past episodes at abcpartners.com slash podcast. This podcast is written, produced, edited, and hosted by Dave Almey. And theme music was composed by Scott Holmes. <laughs>